Welcome back to Good Law, Bad Law. My guest on today's episode is Amanda Frost. She is a professor of law and government at American University and the author of the new book, You Are Not American, Citizenship Stripping from Dred Scott to the Dreamers. This is a really great uh, topic for today, uh, not just for historical interests, uh, but Amanda takes us all the way back to slavery, uh, through other challenges to citizenship that Americans have faced because, oh, they were women who married non-American citizens because they were labor activists or other, uh, others engaged in political protest. And of course, in the modern era, uh, because they were immigrants from a Latin American country. So understanding first what is citizenship and then how the government, how our government and our courts have at times some pretty, pretty embarrassing and bad times in our country's history have used the law to try to remove citizenship and the rights of citizenship by Americans who clearly should have enjoyed citizenship along with all of the rest of us. So Stay tuned for this episode of the podcast and my conversation with Amanda Frost. Everybody stay well. I hope everybody's uh, getting in line to get the vaccine so we can get past this pandemic. Everyone be well and enjoy this episode of Good Law, Bad Law. I want to welcome my guest today, Amanda Frost. She is the Bronfman Professor of Law and Government at the American University Washington College of Law and the author of a new book, which we're going to be talking about today. Uh, the title of the book is You Are Not American, Citizenship Stripping from Dred Scott to the Dreamers. Amanda, thank you so much for being on Good Law, Bad Law, and welcome from France, as I understand you're calling us from Lyon, France. Yes. Well, thank you so much for having me. And yes, the experience of being in France makes me even more appreciative of citizenship and ah, its many benefits. Well, good. Okay. So, well, let's let's uh, let's talk about that first. First, if you would give us a little background on yourself, uh, you know, your your academic interests and how you came to write this book. Yeah. Sure. Um, so, uh, I'm a law professor at American University and. Um, I also, before that, was a, a practicing civil rights lawyer where I did some immigration cases, and I continued to do immigration work as part of the law school faculty. I ran the clinic for a year, even though that's not my normal gig, and have been very involved in various litigation and cases mm -hmm. um, with students and without. So I kept a hand in and began teaching the main class. But the citizenship issues that inspired this book arose um, actually one summer about five years ago when I read about a woman named Ethel McKenzie who had uh, lived in San Francisco at the turn of the 20th century. And she was a young uh, a socialite, wealthy, the heiress to a vineyard. And she got involved in the women's suffrage movement and was instrumental in getting California women the right to vote in 1911 before the rest of the nation. And then, um, she went to vote herself and was told, you can't vote. You married a non-citizen and you are no longer an American citizen yourself. And that shocked me. And then I began looking into it and realized our country had a long and mostly um, unrecognized uh, history of taking away citizenship. And it became something I decided was worthy of a book. Mm. Well, and we're going to talk about different categories of individuals who have face challenges to their citizenship or, or even had their citizenship taken away from them. But just since you brought up that particular example and, and, and that being the story that launched you on this book, I, I too was really shocked to see that example of Americans who have been targets of uh, citizenship challenges. Why women who have married 
non-citizens? What, what is even the, the argument there? Yeah, so it actually what I think about maybe I'll do just for 30 seconds is kind of give a brief um, overview of citizenship and what it is just for yeah. those people who haven't thought about it recently. And then I'll talk about what I think the U.S. federal government was up to when it passed a law saying women who marry non-citizens automatically lose their citizenship. Okay, sure. Yeah, so citizen, yeah, so citizenship, I mean, if you look it up in the Black's Law Dictionary, it's probably what anyone who sort of thinks about it would, for any length, would think it means, which is the right to full membership, and often we mean full political membership. So the right to vote, the right to hold office, serve on a jury, the right or, or duty, perhaps. Um, uh, and, of course, today in the United States, and, and I would say for a good long time now, the most important right of U.S. citizenship is the right to enter and remain in the United States, because even green card holders today, as my clients have come to learn and I have come to learn, um, can be deported sometimes for very minor criminal offenses. So the right to enter and remain is probably the most important right of citizenship, but all the political and civil rights. So that's definitely a focus of my book. But the book is also about the more descriptive elements of citizenship, things like the sense of belonging, the sense of being part of the community's definition of itself. And that's where I find citizenship stripping so interesting because it's the community saying, you are not us. And in doing that, they're further defining what it means to be American by saying some people are not. We are taking away their membership. So well, to turn I, back to... You know, yeah. we, should, we should add to that list, Amanda, too, the... the yeah. The fear of losing citizenship or the fear of losing your right to remain in the country pending citizenship. You know, there, I mean, there are whole yeah. classes of people, millions of people who live with that fear every day. Yep, absolutely. And um, if we do get to the current events, because my book is a history, but it also in the last chapter covers, covers current events, mm -hmm. we can talk about some of the events over the last four years where there was a real effort to ramp up denaturalization. And Masha Gessen, a New Yorker reporter and herself a naturalized citizen, said the fact that there's a significant investigation and, and campaign going on to denaturalize naturalized citizens means that all of us who are naturalized citizens feel that we are now at risk and that if we bring ourselves to the attention of the government, we could be deported. So I think what you just said there is, is, is very important. It's the risk or threat of losing your citizenship is itself in a way, a loss of citizenship. Well, and, I, um, and I, I don't yeah. suppose to, to to just tease very recent events. I don't suppose, yeah. since the book is so new, that you had a chance to add an afterword about those who participate in insurrection against the United States government, including presidents, and whether their citizenship ought to be challenged. But but maybe that's a story for another day. <laughs> Well, no, actually, I'd be very happy to to discuss that maybe in the context of I believe you're talking about Section three of the 14th Amendment exactly, that exactly. takes away some. Well, and that's a big part of my book, but it's it was focused on the historical use of that provision in 1868. But as you say, it's come back uh, potentially right. again. So we right. could talk about that. OK, well, let's well, let's pick up where we, yeah. we, we started, which is yeah. women who and, and I and I gather in particular, it's women who marry non-citizens and not men who marry non-citizens. Exactly. Exactly. So yeah. the so I, I gave you the definition of citizenship, both the legal and also the more the, the qualitative sense of belonging. And so when the U.S. government passed a law saying that women who married non-citizens, whether they were naturalized or immigrants themselves, or whether they were native born, as Ethel McKenzie was, they all just automatically lost their citizenship upon marriage. So the government there was doing a few things. Um, one, it was fearful of dual citizenship at the time. Um, second, it was responding to the sense that the, this was the idea of coverture, the idea that women did not have a separate mm -hmm. legal identity, which in right. 1907, when the law was passed, was, was on its way out, but not completely out. So a family often had one passport or one travel document, and it was in the name of the husband. So that was another reason. But I think a very important additional reason, and it's in the record, congressional debates and discussions, was a sense that these women had betrayed American men, and they didn't belong. They were almost traitors. Yeah. And Incredible. there was hearings on this where members of Congress said things like, aren't good old American boys good enough for you? Oh my God. Yeah, they were, oh. yeah, so they were, they were wow. reacting in this somewhat outraged way to this idea of American women going outside the fold. And, you know, obviously part of this is the children, right? Would, the, would that family and those children be American or would they be other? And it was partially xenophobia and partially sexism, both together, that led to that law. Wow. 
And and was w- w- how widely was this law enforced to to prosecute people like like this one yeah. in California? Yeah. So of course the law was passed in 1907 before the vast majority of women in the United States could vote. So that's also interesting because McKenzie is instrumental in getting California's women the right to vote, which led us, of course, to the 19th Amendment and to the women's right to vote nationwide. But when she went to cast her ballot, she was told she's not a citizen. And as she said, she brought a she like any red blooded American. She filed a lawsuit and she brought it all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court. And she said, I'm doing this not just for me, but for all the women who've lost their right to vote. So she was very focused on that right to vote. But there were also women who were living abroad or who were traveling back and forth who uh, were in danger during the First World War because they'd lost their citizenship or who had married Germans and were considered enemy aliens because they had become German and they lost their property to the U.S. government. And there were women who were deported as a result of their loss of U.S. citizenship upon marriage. So the consequences could be very severe. And Ethel McKenzie said, I, I, I really love her spirit. She said, I'm going to fight this law all the way to the Supreme Court on, for all the women who've lost their citizenship. It's hard to estimate numbers. Mm-hmm. And the, the, so I, I, I won't be able to, to give you a round number or a perfect number, but it's obviously in the tens of thousands of people um, over the course in which this law was in place. It was in place from 1907 um, up until the mid-1930s. It slowly was scaled back, but in fascinating ways, because it stopped applying to white women who married white men, but it continued to apply even in the later 20s and 1930s to women who married men not eligible to naturalize, such as Asians. Mm. So there's a racial component to this law that lasted beyond the law that stripped Ethel McKenzie of her citizenship, which also ties in well with the story I'm telling. I mean, it's completely consistent with the story I'm telling in this book. Well, and the other piece of this story, which, which teases some of the other categories of Americans we're going to be talking about, is political, right? Because she wasn't just, there, there, wasn't, there weren't just concerns about xenophobia and sexism and indeed racism, but there are political concerns. And so, so targets against citizenship can and have been used, as you, as you point out in the book, against whoever is considered a political threat at the, at the time. Yes, and so there's a chapter in the book that focuses on efforts to denaturalize certain activists and political leaders. And that occurred, um, well, as early as 1909 with Emma Goldman and the infamous anarchist, um, mm-hmm. and then went on to, and a labor leader as well, um, and then went on into the 1950s during the Red Scare until the Supreme Court finally I was going to say put a stop to it, but perhaps more accurately thought it put a stop to it in a case called Afrin versus Rusk in 1967. But yes, there's very clear evidence from the archives, and I cite this in in the book, that the government targeted these um, labor leaders, activists, people whose speech they didn't like. They targeted them for denaturalization in an effort to get rid of them. And that was absolutely the case for Emma Goldman, who who was deported, forcibly removed on a boat to Russia. Um, Harry Bridges, this mm-hmm. amazingly charismatic labor leader, had four trials brought by the U.S. government trying to get rid of him, two of them trying to denaturalize him, and he won every one and stayed in the United States. But you know, my, these dad people actually, my dad is a college student and a grad student at Berkeley, actually worked for Harry Bridges in, in San Francisco. Wow. Yeah. Well, I wanna, I'd love to, if you remember, I mean, I'd love to hear more because Harry Bridges reading about him. So, so I should mention here, the book really focuses on the stories of individuals who lost their citizenship, and then I weave the law into that. Mm-hmm. And Harry Bridges is a fascinating guy, charismatic, amazing labor leader, won concessions from employers no one else could, was more of a visionary on race than many in, in, at his time in his field. He was a longshoreman, mm-hmm. and he tried to bring um, black workers into his movement, which before they had been used to, as strike breakers, and he was... Um, as I said, ahead of his time, I won't, he, he wasn't a perfect man by any means, but ahead of his time on, on issues of race and just an amazing guy. So he's one of the people that I really enjoy profiling in the book. Well, and it, we, when I was out in California last year, this was the pandemic has slowed down visits to anywhere, but um, we unearthed an old DVD of a protest in the San Francisco City Hall in the early 60s, I think it was 
1961 or 62, something. No, it had to be before. I was born in 62, so it had to be 1960 or 1961. Uh, the House on American Activities Committee was mm-hmm. putting on a traveling roadshow around the country, and they, they were holding hearings in in San Francisco, in downtown San Francisco. And there in the back of the room is my dad with his his uh his white shirt and thin tie and white socks and wow. uh and wow. Harry Bridges was one of the people that, that the House and American Activities Committee was targeting as well. Yep. A lot of Yep, hundred percent. Yep. Hmm. Wow. No, Harry Harry Bridges was, was absolutely vilified by the California governor, by the mayor of San Francisco, by the House and American Activities Committee, by Congress who mm-hmm. passed bills just to get rid of him, they said. And then at the end of his career, as he's retiring, and I, I don't think I could give you the year, but it was, you know, relatively recent in the 1980s, I think, um, maybe not even 1990s. He's, he's, he's being honored at the National Portrait Gallery in Washington, D.C., with the Secretary of Labor there. Wow. And, and he's a funny guy, Bridges, and he said, you know, a man is never so respected as the day he's retiring. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is a man the police beat over the head with batons, right? Um, and now he's he's honored as a labor leader. All right. Well, so so let's go back in history yeah. before we then go forward again, because the, the yeah. subtitle of the book mentions the mentions Dred Scott, the Dred Scott case. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, there seems an obvious uh, major major set of questions regarding American citizenship when we talk about. Black Americans and slavery. So what? Why Dred yes. Scott? Why is that a particular focus? Yeah. in your story. Yeah, so I'm gonna uh, and and um, I'll mention. I think Dred Scott and actually that that's my first chapter, but the second chapter is really the the crux of the book. I've come to think of it as the most important chapter in the sense that it talks about what I call the race for citizenship between um, white Confederate former leaders of the Confederacy and the former slaves. So I'll start with Dred Scott, and then if we have um, the time, I'd love to talk about the Civil War era, which I think of as immensely important in the story. So I I focus on Dred Scott because, um, you know, Dred Scott filed his suit for freedom together with his wife and claimed they'd been brought by their owner into free territory and so were free. Um, But a a sort of threshold question in the litigation, as uh, anyone who's studied civil procedure knows, if you're bringing your case in federal court under a state law, you need to show diversity of citizenship. And so he needed to show he was a citizen. And that had been assumed on many occasions by many people that free blacks were citizens. And of course, Dred Scott was arguing I'm free. And indeed, black people had voted to ratify the U.S. Constitution. Um, So it would be bizarre to say they'd voted and been allowed to vote to ratify a document that took their citizenship. And the federal government had given black sailors their documents saying they were citizens. And the reference to a natural born citizen in the constitution suggested birthright citizenship, which existed in England, had been inherited by the US. But that said, the US constitution says nothing about citizenship. It doesn't define the term and uses it only to talk about who uh, can be president and who can serve in Congress without defining it. And this was a country you know, polarized by racialized slavery and, you know, obviously hypocritical down to its very roots and founding documents in the fact that all men are created equal, but at the same time we have slaves. And I think that question of citizenship was essential because if free blacks were citizens, it put at risk the whole um, endeavor of slavery. And Chief Justice Taney, who decided Dred Scott, knew this. Now, he pointed out there was a great hypocrisy and a great tension between the declaration. Uh, statement that all men are created equal and a, a country that has slavery. But he reconciled that by saying, well, no one ever thought any black person was a citizen and a free or slave, they have no rights. So overnight, he took away citizenship from the half a million free black people in the United States who could vote in some states and had some political rights. And of course, he took away any hope of citizenship for uh, the four million slaves. And uh, the decision was part of what precipitated this, the Civil War, of course. So that takes me to the to the Civil War, which was fought over slavery. The end of it, 13th Amendment abolished slavery. But in 1865, it was clear that the blacks were no longer slaves. Slavery was dead. It was not clear that they would be citizens at all, nor was it clear what would happen to the former leaders of the Confederacy, like Robert E. Lee mm-hmm. and uh, Jefferson Davis. So that was a real question. And the Republicans in Congress, the radical Republicans, the party of Lincoln, the party at that point who was uh, the racially progressive party, they said, 
we have to do something about this. And it wasn't just, you know, good heartedness, although actually a whole bunch of them seem to have genuine, deep beliefs in equality that, frankly, some of our leaders don't hold today. But they, uh, they also had political power in mind, as politicians do. And they knew that if they gave the leaders of the Confederacy, if they gave the South, all, all the white people in the South, back political power at the end of the war, without giving it to the four million slaves, that in fact, the South would have even more political power than they had before the war. And the reason for that was that the Constitution said that all people, the total population of each state would be counted for allocating members of the House of Representatives and Congress and in the Electoral College. But of course, the Constitution said that slaves will only be counted as three-fifths of a person. So the, sla- the South had about 20 um, or so slave seats going into the Civil War, seats that they controlled solely because they owned slaves. And of course, slaves had no right to vote or exercise any power over those members of the House of Representatives. But ironically, after the Civil War, the South was poised to exercise even greater political power. Because now the 4 million former slaves, some of whom made up a majority in the states they were in, like Mississippi and Louisiana, if the white leaders had their had their say, those people would still not vote, still have no political power. But the South would have even more members of Congress and even more power in Congress. So the leaders of Reconstruction said, we can't let this happen. And here's what they did. They, in the 14th Amendment, first sentence of Section 1, said that if you're born in the United States, you're a citizen. So that's the birthright citizen provision that overruled Dred Scott and gave all people born in the United States, including the former slaves who'd been told they weren't citizens by the Supreme Court, it gave them citizenship. And then Section 3 of the 14th Amendment said, and if you were engaged in insurrection and you'd formally sworn an oath to uphold the Constitution, you can never serve in a state or federal office absent two-thirds of the vote of Congress overruling that and allowing you to serve. But it doesn't. Well, meant, like but it doesn't. Yeah. It doesn't address yeah. the question of whether their citizenship is yeah. revoked. It just that that section three only serves as a bar to political office. Well, so yes and no, and that's where I, I, it, it depends on how you interpret it. So first of all, okay. during the Civil War, plenty of people said the former leaders of the South, well, at the time the leaders of the South, the leaders of the Confederacy, were no longer citizens. The Supreme Court said it. Charles Sumner said they're enemy aliens. Thaddeus Stevens said it, a, a member of Congress. Um, and, of course, the reason was they'd expatriated themselves, right? They'd, they'd said, we're a new country. We have a, our own flag, our own army, our own currency, our own president, our own constitution. So they'd really you know, said, we're not Americans anymore. They'd done right. it by choice. So after the war, at least some of them, like Robert E. Lee, said, well, I'll, I'll, rejoin, I'll rejoin the union. But they didn't have civil and political rights at that point. They, Lee couldn't vote until very close to um, the end of his life, five years after the war. And he could never serve office, hold office again um, because of Section 3. And here's the, so, so was he a U.S. citizen? Well, he'd lost a lot of the rights of citizenship. Um, but as if we want to fast forward to, I don't want to jump ahead too far, but yeah, no, that's okay. there was a question about whether he was, you know, he lost citizenship rights. And he, of course, had claimed at one point to not, want to be an American. So he died in that status. He was never pardoned. In fact, he was indicted for treason and was at risk of being executed at you know, periods shortly after the war. Um, and of course, the former slaves who, by the 14th Amendment under Section 1, became citizens could hold office. And so we saw black men get elected to office, including a man named Hiram Revels, who took over as a senator of Mississippi, taking the seat that had formerly been occupied by Jefferson Davis the leader of the Confederacy who no longer could hold office. So then, of course, we all know, I think everyone listening knows the, the sad end of the story, which is at the end of Reconstruction, the tables turned, the former leaders of the Confederacy took back political power and disenfranchised the black residents of the South. It, it happened somewhat in the North as well, but very extremely in the South, up until the Voting Rights Act. But here's the sort of capstone to this whole story. Um, in 1975, Congress, by joint resolution, voted to give Robert E. Lee his citizenship back. Now, obviously purely symbolic, um, but they did it. They said, there's no American more admirable than Lee. Um, Ford, President Ford signed it into law on the steps of Lee's former house at Arlington Cemetery. And Jefferson Davis got his citizenship back a few years later. And this is a purely symbolic moment, but I think a very significantly symbolic moment that shows you how quickly the tables turned after the Civil War where men like Lee and Davis, who'd lost their citizenship rights, 
were then, of course, um, uh, celebrated throughout monuments in the South. And men like Hiram Revels, his name is unknown. I did not know that name until I began research mm -hmm. on this book. He's the first black member of Congress. Well, There's that, no monuments to him. But that, okay, so, but again, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm curious about these distinctions because on the one hand, there, there is citizenship <clears throat> and then there are various citizenship rights. And, and yeah. you know, right to vote, the, the varying political rights, but as you also said, the right to enter and remain in the United States. So, uh, I, well, I guess in the case of Robert E. Lee and Jefferson Davis, they, they did lose citizenship by, not, is it by virtue of Section 3 of the 14th Amendment, or is it by virtue of yeah. the fact that they had declared themselves not American. They had declared themselves part of an enemy state, the Confederacy. Yeah, I mean, both. And that's mm -hmm. partly why they weren't allowed to vote as well for a, a period of time. And I'll also add, it was not clear they could remain in the United States. Now, in the end, those two men did. Mm -hmm. But um, Jefferson Davis, when he was caught, was on his way to try to go to Mexico. And a whole bunch of former leaders of the Confederacy did leave the country, feeling they had no other place to, to go. And Lincoln, before he died, said, let's just make them leave the United States. Mm -hmm. And I should add, the former slaves were also at risk of being deported until they got their citizenship. So the, the right to remain was not clear. But your point about what made them non-citizens, I mean, I don't want to be technical and legal about this. In, at, at times I am in the book, and I explain that clearly. But at times we're talking more about that more symbolic sense of citizenship. So they lost some political and civil rights. Were they technically citizens or not? Some of them said they, they felt they were no longer citizens because originally they'd want, not wanted to be, but then also their country wouldn't take them back. So they viewed themselves that way. I see. Okay. All right. Well, so, so let's, let's fast forward then because, of course, the concept of citizenship in, in the modern times is really part of a discussion about immigration and, and particularly yeah. immigration from um, – from countries south of the U.S. border. You don't often hear about big citizenship debates involving immigrants from Canada or Europe, um, yeah. uh, maybe more so from the, the countries that our former president referred to very derogatorily. I won't even say the word. Um, yeah. <clears throat> uh, but, but primarily in terms of immigrants from Mexico, Central America, and so on. So how has the citizenship debate when it comes to the risk of losing your citizenship, uh, how does that play into the, the contemporary conversation about immigration? Yeah, so I'm gonna start uh, just a little farther back and then get to the, the, the mm -hmm. countries you're referring to. So I think really the nation sort of tested its ideas of who was a citizen and began on the path that we're on today regarding excluding immigrants with the Chinese. Um, the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, followed by a man whose case I, follow, I describe in detail in the book, Wong Kim Ark, who was born in San Francisco in 1870. But when he visited China, he lived in the United States most of his life, but he visited China and when he came back, the government had been looking for a test case and they found him and said, we're not gonna let you in. We, we concede you're born in the US, but we don't think that section one of the 14th amendment means what it says. We don't think that you are a citizen because both your parents were immigrants, which was an interesting argument to make because that disenfranchised and, and uh, uh, stripped of citizenship, not just men like Wong Kim Ark, whose parents were Chinese immigrants, legal by the way, but also all the other children of immigrants in the United States. Um, and it, it was a, a sweeping argument to make before the Supreme Court, but the US made it, the government made it and lost. So that was the start of an effort both to exclude certain groups, because before that, there'd been relatively little exclusion of immigrants. And it was an effort to try to define who was who could be a, a birthright American. And it was clear that the government had a racialized view of that, that if you weren't white, you uh, weren't automatically an American at birth. And in fact, at that period of time, Asians were not allowed to naturalize. They were barred by law from naturalizing, and that remained in place until 1952. So that was the debate about that started with the Chinese. And then, of course, today and in the 20th century up to today, much of it focused on uh, the countries in Mexico and, and uh, the Latin American countries. 
as well. So, so, so the last part of your sub, the, of the subtitle of the book references the Dreamers. Um, so these are, I mean, this is a group of hundreds of thousands of people who've come to this country, as many of them as children, uh, grown up here, but they weren't born here, so they don't have a claim to birthright citizenship. Um, although there is a large group of children of immigrants, uh, you know, in this population who were born here, but but the Dreamers in particular, tell us about that and 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 how concerns about citizenship being stripped apply to that group of people. Yeah. So. Um, first, I'll just mention in the book, because again, it was something I, I had not known about personally myself and, and probably should have been, I'll mention here, which is there'd been a mass deportation of uh, immigrants from Mexico primarily in the 1930s during the Depression, and then again in the 1950s under the, uh, um, a program under uh, President Eisenhower called Operation Wetback, believe it or not. Gosh. And that the numbers vary. Oh. There's there's some. Can there be any more more embarrassing stories about our country's history we're going to cover today? I know. Well, oh, yeah. And horrible. I that the book describes some pretty grim U.S. history, but there are yeah. many uplifting moments in the book, including moments when, you know, Americans do the right thing. The U.S. citizens are fighting alongside their fellow Americans to protect citizenship and defend what I see as the extraordinary egalitarian values of the 14th Amendment and birthright citizenship. So the, the story is not all right. you know, well, just and the, and badly. The Supreme Court <laughs> does get it right here and there, too, which is good to know. Yes, yes. Uh, the Supreme Court is, is a mixed bag, frankly. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's, a, it's a product of its time, often. So, um, so yes, it's sort of extraordinary, these mass roundups and deportations, many of which ended up removing U.S. citizens. Over 60 percent of the people removed in the 1930s were citizens, although some of them were the children of, of immigrants, which is a, a major problem, how you, how you deal with the U.S. citizen children. You don't want to separate families. That's no answer, as we've come to learn, we've or we should have always known. Um, so, so that's some of the background there. That, and, and of course, the view was, by an official said it, is these people aren't really American. You know, they're not, fine, they're here, fine, their children were born here, fine, they're legal, fine, some of them are naturalized, but we don't really view them as fellow Americans. That was clearly what was going on. So, the dreamers in the title, I, I first I will admit there's some alliteration going on there, right? <laughs> Citizenship stripping from Dred Scott to the dreamers. Right. I don't claim the dreamers are citizens in any legal sense, uh, although certainly culturally, right? They're often brought to the U.S. at very young ages, educated in the United States, speak fluent English, unaccented. You know, they're, they're as American as you or I. They just don't have the paperwork. And, and, and so they grow I, up and yeah. work and pay taxes and yeah, everything else. All those. Yeah. So, so of course, Biden is last week, the House passed a portion of his U.S. Citizenship Act of 2021, which would give Dreamer citizenship. It doesn't look likely to pass in the Senate. But so the Dreamer citizenship is a live question. But actually, when I was referring to the Dreamers in the title, I was also thinking about President Trump, who um, at times was very effective as president, but was quite effective on some issues in immigration. And he repeatedly said, that he wanted to strip the children of undocumented immigrants of their citizenship. So that would very much include the children of dreamers. And he said it repeatedly, and he said he could do it unilaterally. Now, he didn't end up trying to do it during his term in office, but he threatened that repeatedly. And of course, just the threat itself undermines one's status and sense of legitimacy. And can you imagine if we lived in a country in which we not only had 11 million undocumented immigrants, but all the children of undocumented immigrants were undocumented immigrants, and the children of the children, and I mean, this would create the caste-based society that is exactly what Charles Sumner and the leaders of Reconstruction said we must ensure does not happen. And that's the reason we have birthright citizenship. Right. right, right. Incredible. Um, I, and I'm, I'm going to look forward to reading some of those uplifting stories as well, because the story of citizenship in this country has, uh, has indeed had some, some pretty stained moments. Um, and and I'm sorry I didn't get a chance to read the book before we talked today, but I am going to get it. Um, I'm really looking forward to it, and we will, as we as we do in the description for this episode, we'll put a link so people uh, listening can can easily get a copy and and, and I think well they should because this is uh, this this couldn't be more relevant uh, a subject than it is today, and we didn't even really get a chance to talk about birtherism, but. Obviously, yes, obviously, yes, which, uh, yes. Our, our own president 
uh, President Obama yeah. and his citizenship challenged, uh, thankfully, unsuccessfully. Um, yeah, well, although you say that, but I, I'll say uh, yeah. he actually polls show that he was, people believe more than half the people polled in 2016 in one poll thought he no. wasn't a citizen. Right, eligible still believe president. it. So I, it was successful in a way. Yeah. I think most of those are, are Fox News viewers. Uh, as well. <laughs> that could be. Uh, <laughs> Um, as, if, if we want to really talk about who has, yeah. uh, who has risked losing their citizenship or should have, should have risked it. Mm-hmm. Um, but anyway, Amanda Frost, thank you so much. Uh, Amanda's the author of the new book, You Are Not American, Citizenship Stripping from Dred Scott to the Dreamers. Uh, thanks again. It was, this was really fun and I appreciate it and, and learned a lot. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. I appreciate it. 